we're going to talk today about Charlemagne, and we're going to talk about Europe and the architecture of Europe in the Middle Ages. Charlemagne descends through Pepin from a line of Frankish kings, and back in 599 AD, Clovis, king of the Franks, adopted Christianity as his religion. Charlemagne was very adamant about enforcing the spread of Christianity throughout the territories that he conquered. On one occasion, it is said that he slaughtered 4,500 pagans who would not convert and agree to be baptized as Christians. And so if you wonder why nobody's worshipping Zeus and Athena anymore, Charlemagne is probably more responsible for that than most historical figures. Charlemagne was a very successful general, and in his combats he was able to unite vast, vast swaths of Europe. So you see over here in green and in light green the extent of the Byzantine Empire. This is what Justinian had coming in. The light green is what Justinian had going out. But all around, there are barbarian tribes. We have the Vandals in North Africa. We have the Franks in France. We have the Visigoths in Spain, the Ostrogoths in Italy. You name it. Barbarians everywhere. And so Charlemagne is successful in uniting together a lot of these lands, forming a strong centralized empire. And he actually goes to Rome and has the Pope crown him emperor, and kind of like a, a holy Roman emperor, although that term doesn't come into currency at the time. And so Charlemagne's embrace of Christianity, Charlemagne's unification of these vast lands in Europe, also had to do with a rebalance of power in Europe at the time. And again, if you look over here, all of Spain at this period is under Islamic control, and all of uh, the area in through here is under Islamic control. So Charlemagne consolidates this new kingdom that, that more or less is France and Germany as his, his new kingdom. This is Charlemagne's vision where St. James appears to him and tells him, go forth and conquer. And this is his magnificent coronation by the Pope in Rome. Insofar as Charlemagne identified himself with the Romans, he tried to make manifest symbols of his power in a way that was specifically Roman. We looked very briefly at this equestrian statue of Charlemagne, or if not Charlemagne, at least some other Carolingian king. And even the idea that he would be portrayed riding a horse is a Roman idea. One of the few large-scale statues that comes down to us from antiquity is this one that we see on the left-hand side of the screen. That's probably Marcus Aurelius on a horse. There were a lot of large-scale bronze statues in classical antiquity. Most of them got melted down to make cannons or cannonballs or munitions of other sorts. But this one was thought to be a statue of Constantine for a very long time. And since Constantine was the first Christian emperor, the statue received special treatment and was preserved. And ha, it wasn't. It was Marcus Aurelius. Now, we always find it instructive to make these comparisons between figural arts of different periods. And if you look at the Marcus Aurelius statue and you look at the Carolingian statue, it's a sad little copy, kind of. Look at the muscularity of the horse. Look at the gesture of the out, outstretched hand of, of the Marcus Aurelius figure. Look at the way the drapery falls on gravity. Look at the flex in the calf. You can feel the kind of <coughs> engagement of man and horse. And here in the Carolingian statue, it really is a kind of little wooden puppet on a very stiff, almost cartoon version of a horse. It's also much smaller. The Marcus Aurelius statue is about 11 and a half feet tall, and the Carolingian statue is about this tall. So even 50 years before, this is a technological marvel. The idea that he would have himself cast in bronze, riding a horse, is just one glimpse into Charlemagne's ambition to reconstitute himself as a Roman emperor, as a holy Roman emperor, both Christian and emperor. Because this is a pose that Roman emperors would often favor for their own portraiture. What makes it hard to do is that this task of casting in bronze had more or less been forgotten. It might have been possible to make a few pairs of candlesticks or maybe a little you know, cup, but these 
task of casting a equestrian statue in bronze is an engineering problem. Like, how do you get these little horse legs to support the weight of everything else above it? Or even how do you make a mold that will allow you to liberate this statue? Because if you cast in bronze, you basically have to make a, a wax model first. Then you make a kind of clay mold around that, cut it in half, pull that apart, melt your bronze. See, I could have been the guy who made this. <laughs> and, and then you pour the molten bronze in there, but it's not that easy, right? Because there are all of these undercuts. There are all of these little things that are going to get stuck in the mold. So you just have to figure out ways to put it together and piece it together. So these are some of the artifacts of Charlemagne, his crown, the pendant, his equestrian statue. And Charlemagne had a had a person in his court who wrote his biography. And the biography of Charlemagne follows the models of, say, Suetonius's life of Augustus. Just follows exactly the same formula as though this is just one more emperor whose life is being described according to court formula. When it comes time for Charlemagne to build a palace, he builds it in Aachen, which is sort of right around in through here. It's present day Germany, but in those days, National borders were not so well defined. He builds a palace in Aachen. He has an architect called Odo of Metz. And a lot of the ideas about the palace of uh, Charlemagne pull from Roman precedent. But these Carolingian co copies are always slightly off. And I think it's really a nice little window into a culture to see what they copy and what they discard. For example, one of the Carolingian buildings is a little gatehouse at a monastery in Lorsch in Germany. In contemporary Carolingian texts is described as a model of a triumphal arch. It's a Roman triumphal arch. And you look at this thing and you have to say, I don't think so. I've seen triumphal arches. The Constantine arch that we see on the right hand side of the screen is a good example of a triumphal arch. So in what sense could the Lorsch gatehouse be a triumphal arch? And, and a lot of it has to do with an interest in numerology, for example, number symbolism, which becomes more important than, say, physical attributes of the building. The idea that there is a um, patterned surface substitutes in for the idea that there is a fully plastic and developed system of, of articulation on the Constantine arch. What really counts is the notion of three, that three is the trinity, three is a holy number. We have three openings match. Funny idea, though clunky proportions. And another possible thing that's being referred to, and, and maybe the gatehouse at Lorsch isn't as clunky and silly as I was suggesting. Maybe it's folding in two different references at the same time. Maybe on one hand, through number symbolism, it's alluding to the, the Roman precedent of a triumphal arch. But in another way, it's alluding to the little uh, propyleum, the entryway to the courtyard of old St. Peter's Church. So we have this little gate piece here that this also begins to look like. And so <clears throat> in its clumsiness, it manages to adhere to two, two precedents or two models. Here we have a drawing, and this is one of the oldest architectural drawings that comes down to us, a Carolingian drawing from 820 of a monastery in Switzerland, St. Gall. And if you look at this plan of the monastery, it really is kind of modeled on the Roman camp, kind of using as its precedent, and here we have Diocletian's palace, which is a kind of Roman camp, a gridded organization with a thick bar of program, a thick bar of program, uh, and, and so forth, with fora in the middle, with fora, or let's say, courtyards in the middle. So at every moment, if there's a Roman precedent available, the Carolingians use it, and then transform it in some horribly inappropriate way. <laughs> or let's say, in a way deeply and richly loaded with meaning. So now let's go back to the palace in Aachen. So here's the palace in Aachen, and it's a kind of odd thing in that there is a courtyard over here and a round building over here with a couple of little buildings clipping onto it, a long connecting piece and a little basilica over there. It's a kind of hodgepodge of buildings on one sense, or in another sense, it models itself again on Roman precedent. And we see here uh, one of the Roman fora, 
where a temple, the Forum of Augustus, where a temple piece slips in uh, to a courtyard and becomes the object in that courtyard. And that's kind of what's going on over here. This round chapel slips into a courtyard as a Roman temple would slip into a courtyard. Because after all, Charlemagne is Roman. He was a Roman emperor as far as he's concerned. But it's not simply a temple. Because remember, when we were discussing church typology, Christian church typology earlier in this class, we mentioned that there was no interest in appropriating the formal language of pagan temples for Christian churches. That would be crazy, right? Why would you put a temple on a Christian church? Temple fronts, like the one we have here at the Forum of Augustus, belong to pagan ritual. So there's a different typology that comes into play. Over here we see San Vitale in Ravenna that we looked at earlier in this class. And you could also even say the mausoleum, the martyrium of Santa Costanza in Rome, which is even earlier, comes into play. Both are centralized churches. Both are churches ringed with an ambulatory. Both are churches that suppress the notion of procession in favor of a tall, centralized space, a single center. <laughs> there are other precedents that could also be considered. For example, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. And maybe this is even the closest model. And this is, again, very, very early, 345B. This is meant to be constructed on the place of Christ's tomb. Here, there's a really strong, figural, centralized building preceded by a courtyard. So the clunky, awkward, Carolingian copy gains richness by folding together all of these different precedents. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the Roman Forum, San Vitale in Ravenna. And, and Ravenna, when San Vitale was constructed, was the capital of the Western Roman Empire. So as a successor to the Roman Empire, he's simply making a kind of broad sweep through the precedents available to him. So let's look at the chapel, the palace chapel in Aachen. It's also called the Palatine Chapel, and it's sometimes called Aix-la-Chapelle. As a point of comparison, this is Aix-la-Chapelle, and this is San Vitale, and this is Aix-la-Chapelle. They're really very, very similar. They're both round churches with this very, very tall space and a permeable ambulatory. An ambulatory is the space ringing the perimeter. The language of, of the palace chapel is a kind of hybrid almost between Roman plasticity, let's say, and the flatness of a Byzantine wall. For example, we see the stonework. There's a kind of pattern making, a kind of <coughs> articulating the arch, showing you how the structure works, and so forth, as opposed to the simple flatness of mosaic ornament that we saw in the um, earlier examples. When Charlemagne dies, his kingdom is divided into three parts. There, Louis the German is, is Charlemagne's son, and he gets what is more or less Germany. Charles the Bald gets what is more or less France, and Lothar gets stuff in the middle. But what's important is that the consolidation of all these lands into one unified power was brief but fairly effective. Civil governments become much, much less important in organizing the orderly exchange of everyday life than monastic orders, which become stronger and stronger and stronger. And it's a period of incredible difficulty from a, from a lot of fronts. <laughs> Everybody bad is coming in. For example, the, the red arrows that you see coming down from the north are Viking raiders. And the Viking raiders find that these monasteries, these centers of culture, these centers of learning, are incredibly rich. And so they're good targets to pilfer. If you want to get some gold, if you want to get some nice jeweled candelabra, go no farther than a magnificent monastery. The Magyars are coming in from the east. And likewise, they're threatening the stability of all these countries. And the um, Islamic forces are coming in from the south. So Europe is very, very unstable. There's an attempt to band together in little alliances to get... get uh, a stronger position of stability. During this period, the Crusades to the Holy Lands begin. They begin in like about 1100 and they go on for a while. But particularly, and what we want to talk about is monasticism becomes a really, really strong institution. Already in the fifth century, St. Benedict began to 
organized monasteries in a way that were much, much more centric and much, much more, let's say, bureaucratic and about developing an extensive structure of trade and commerce and the exchange of ideas and the exchange of technologies. So that you began to get developments like uh, mills, water wheels, or grape presses. And because they were so successful at the in inventive, almost proto-industrialization of agriculture, they got richer and richer and richer. So this is just a little map of monasteries. Trier, by the way, up here was a Roman town. Cologne was a Roman town. These were all Roman towns. And, and now everything is fully Christian. The strongest of all the monasteries was Cluny in the southeastern part of France. And what made Cluny so successful is that it wasn't organized by affiliations with regional dukes and princes and so forth, but it had responsibilities only to Rome. So it had an incredibly elaborate structure, and it, it lent land and donations to other monasteries following the, the Cluniac rituals, and, and trade routes became widely established. Most of Cluny was destroyed. This is a little piece of it that exists. And it's worth looking at this fragment of the third construction of the Cluny church, because it begins to show us certain things that are typical of architecture of this period. And let's call this period Romanesque. And why would we call it Romanesque? And, and an answer would be kind of Roman, Romanesque. That sounds kind of stupid and flippant. But, but what I mean by that is, is sort of serious. It's an architecture that deals with the wall as a heavy object, and it borrows a lot of formal ideas from Roman architecture, like the round-headed arch that we saw, or the barrel vault, or the groin vault. So there are lots of technological uh, and structural developments that are, are conserved, or let's say rediscovered in Romanesque ar architecture and widely applied. In terms of the general massing of the building, and by massing I mean the disposition of geometrical volumes that make up the form, that this fragment of Cluny is, is a good example of what we characterize as Romanesque. Typically you get these really simple, severe geometric solids. It's not an architecture that tends to dissolve into highly elaborated surfaces, but rather it conserves the, the volumetrics. So here we see this kind of conical hat and this octagonal tower base or this rectilinear prism of a tower base. It's almost like you could build Romanesque buildings with children's blocks because everything is so blocky and so clear and so, so strongly defined. Cluny is a model of Jerusalem in its articulation and its, in its symbolism, and it's huge. Just to give you a, a sense of how Cluny grew and prospered, this is Cluny I, the first Cluny church. Cluny is the town. It's the church of St. Peter and Paul, but everybody would refer to it as Cluny. Really quite modest in scale. By the time the next Cluny church is built, only about 30 years later, it is you know, quadrupled in size. And notice the structure of this church. This is the kind of church that you begin to see, the type of church you begin to see again and again as a pilgrimage church. You have pilgrims coming in, and you need to have lots of circulation at the perimeter because they're visiting different altars, they're visiting different shrines. So we have a double aisle system here, and we have lots of little radial chapels here in the apse that begin to accommodate multiple shrines. Even here in the transepts, and we have a double transept because we have so much to venerate in a powerful abbey like Cluny. In here we have a little, little, little chapels coming off of, of the transept also. And the chapels, for the most part, want to face east, so they don't unfold symmetrically off the transepts. They go up in the direction that the apse and the radiating chapels of the apse are moving. This is a little map of medieval sites, um, and Cluny is right in here. And there's a strong density of these Romanesque buildings right around the Cluny region. This network of monasteries makes travel safer, particularly travel for pilgrims. And there's this big exchange of ideas along pilgrimage routes, too. This is a fragment, let's say, of the network of pilgrimage routes to the Church of Santiago de Compostelo, the Church of St. James in Spain. As people make these pilgrimages, they make offerings, they bring with them 
local cultures. There's a, there's a consolidation of the culture of Europe through the pilgrimage churches. And the kinds of things they're going to see are important relics because you can bring benefit to the everlasting life of your soul or the soul of loved ones by making pilgrimages. This is, for example, a reliquary. And a reliquary is something that you put a relic in. And a relic is something that was once part of a very holy person, like a saint. So what do you suppose was in this reliquary? Any ideas? Could it be a foot? This is somebody's hand. And here you have a couple more reliquaries. This is one of my favorite reliquaries. This is in the church of San Domenico in Siena. And it's just a little shrunken head of St. Catherine. She was a very holy woman. And there you have it. If you go to Santiago de Compostela today, the roads, and by the roads I mean like the interstate highways, will be full of people like this man right over here with a shell around their neck and a walking stick making the pilgrimage. People still make the pilgrimage today. And the shell is for eating and drinking and begging because you're having this kind of uh, completely ascetic life. You're denying yourself pleasures of the flesh and you're just relying on the mercy of strangers as you make this pilgrimage. This is the church of Santiago de Compostela, the destination of the great pilgrimage routes. And you look at the facade and this is not an accurate representation of a facade. This is all baroque up in a way that is not recognizable. But the plan typology we still see as a Romanesque pilgrimage church plan typology. And we know that because we have this continuous ambulatory around the edge. You could walk the entire perimeter of the church and venerate all the different altars while other activities are going on in the nave and the transept. And if you look at this massing model of how Santiago de Compostela would have looked in its original form, you begin to see that it too adheres to these basic rules about you know, what constitutes a Romanesque church. Really simple massing, really strong geometries, small punched windows, a real emphasis on the solidity of the wall. In terms of the structure of the church, the superstructure of the church, there'll be lots of round-headed arches and probably lots of barrel vaults and cross vaults going in here. So these are just a number of pilgrimage churches as a point of comparison. Uh, Santiago de Compostelo, the first one that we see over here, and some, some minor churches along the route to Santiago, Tours, Toulouse, and Conque. And typologically, they're all pretty darn similar. They all permit the circulation at the perimeter. They all have these radial chapels. And they all also have another feature, which is this thickened edge that we see over here. And this thickened edge is called a west work. Uh, this is the thickened edge, often flanked by two towers. This is a baroque up version of a west work, where we have two towers and a facade. And this is quite different from what we had with our early Christian churches that we looked at before, where the outward expression of the church facade was more or less hidden behind a courtyard where the church was not ostentatious, where the church was not projecting its status and wealth, but rather was emphasizing its humility. By the time we get here, it's all about this, this new, almost billboard-like expression of the power of the church through these, these big facades. Let's look at this little church in France, a little monastic church called Saint-Foy, which means holy faith. If you saw this plan, you would know immediately, just by looking at the plan, that it was probably a pilgrimage church, and you would probably know it's Romanesque. Why would you know those things? What qualities would tell you that about this building? Who's got an idea? Yes? OK, we have chapels radiating off the transept. Good. And you had plaid shirt guy. You had a comment. We have the ambulatories along the edges. Great. And another thing that you can see is the windows are pretty small, right? This is a building that has a lot to do with a heavy, massive wall, and not so much to do with the dematerialization of that wall. Although this type of plan, that is to say a Latin cross plan with radiating chapels at the apse, could also be the kind of plan you find for a Gothic church. But in the case of a Gothic church, there would be a lot, a lot less wall here. It would be a lot more dematerialized. 
This aerial view of the church of Saint Foy shows you a west work, a kind of classic Romanesque west work. Two towers, the idea of a surface that gets punched in very specific ways. Specific ways are round-headed windows. And now we have a new feature, which is this round circular window, which is called a rose window. And the rose window represents the Virgin Mary. And it's a feature that becomes increasingly part of what every Romanesque and, and Gothic church has. And the, the rose window represents the Virgin Mary. And the cult of the Virgin Mary becomes very, very popular. And if you think about the whole inscription of this you know, army of saints into the, the simple early Christian religion, by the, time, by the time we're here in the Romanesque period, we have a saint that can do almost everything. You know, a saint that can help you find things. Is that St. Jude? A saint that can help you study hard. I don't know who that is. You better find that one by two weeks from now. Part of that has to do with incorporating local pagan cults into Christianity. So Mary becomes incredibly important because you need to have a really strong um, maternal figure within the kind of pantheon of people associated with the church. So the rose window represents the Virgin Mary. She is meant to be like a rose, which is to say beautiful but untouchable because of the thorns. Um, she is, of course, the Virgin Mother of Christ, so beautiful but untouchable. And we have the rose window to remind us of that. There are a couple of interesting things going on in this facade also. Notice these vertical buttresses that support the wall and are beginning to suggest a certain kind of verticality and a different kind of articulation than the articulation we had in classical buildings. Because one thing that the classical orders always did is bring down any building, no matter how big that building was, to human scale. So you see something like the Colosseum, which is colossal. Colosseum. But it breaks itself into st multiple stories, all of which are articulated by a columnar order. And you, you can kind of measure the dimensions of your own body against the dimensions of the columns. The orders have that property. Here the vertical is beginning to be exaggerated in such a way as to take your eye away from bodies on earth and up toward heaven. This is just the little church of saint Foy in its densely packed little town. And this is an important reliquary in saint Foy. And in fact, this is considered to be one of the most precious reliquaries and, and pieces of figural statuary from the period. It's gold, it's encrusted with gems, sort of like that little equestrian statue, the Carolingian equestrian statue we looked at, in its rigidity, in its hieratic posture. Not a posture involving a human being engaged in natural activity, but striking a ritual pose. Here's another monastic complex, the Fontanet Abbey, also Romanesque. And it's worth looking at this because it has all the component parts that you need for this new type, which is monastery. It has a cloister, which is a courtyard over here. It has a church. It has a refectory, which is a dining hall. It has various chapter houses for meetings to take place and so forth. The idea of the monastery has to do with an attitude that monastic communities had, and that was pulling them, themselves out of the world and having this inward community. So much so that although the monastic complex proper represents one level of engagement with the world, the cloister pulls you even further inward. And here's the facade of the Fontanet Abbey Church. It really is severe in its plenarity. We see these vertical buttresses, we see the round punched windows, but we really see a dominant architecture of wall. And just to remind you about these arches and these barrel vaults that we're seeing increasingly in the Romanesque churches, as we mentioned before, there are limits to what post and beam structures can do. And a lot of that has to do with failure at the points, points of connection, where the lintel will snap and break. The arch, by contrast, transfers loads horizontally, or let's say diagonally, through the system and becomes a kind of self-supporting stable element. The barrel vault translates the arch through space and begins to make the superstructure, 
the interior roof form of a lot of these Romanesque churches. And sometimes you have aisles clipped on. And this is more or less what we got at the Fontane church, a barrel vault with little barrel vaults on the side of it. And then all these systems work in tandem. The lateral thrust here gets deflected over here, and you have an intact system. I want to show you one more monastery, because this one is late, but it's a really good one. And when I say late, it's 1396. By the time we get to 1396, we could already be talking about Renaissance buildings in a certain context. And this is a building from Italy, so that's where the Renaissance hits. It's the Certosa of Pavia, and Pavia is just outside of Milan. I like this one because I think it's the clearest example of all of these hierarchical divisions that get brought to you by the, the monastic compound. So here's the church. And notice the church is strange. It's almost as though there's like a little baby church, a little baby cruciform church stuck at the apse of the church. And that's because it's a monastic church, and these monks pull themselves out of society and do not occupy the same space as the laity. So if there are people from the town of Pavia that want to worship at the service, they would come in here, and the monks who live in this community would go into the little baby church over here the monk's choir, it would be called. Likewise, there are all of these different spaces. This is a kind of farmyard for all the agricultural crops being grown by the monk. And this is a forecourt. And in this forecourt, called a parvi, this is a place that the laity and the abbot, the leader of, of the monastery, could get together and, and exchange goods. For example, the laity might bring chickens in exchange for the honey that the monks have made, and things like that. And that could happen in this space. But the spaces in through here, the cloisters, are only for the monks. And in the case of the Certosa of Pavia, this big cloister is a place where all the monks can commune. But if you notice, along the edge here, each monk has his own little garden. So you get this kind of nesting of different scales of elements. The kind of overall monastic compound, the big cloister, the little cloister, and so forth. And the same happens with the church. And it kind of reminds me, and not in a very serious way, but it kind of reminds me of the geometry of the fractal. And when I say it kind of reminds me of the geometry of the fractal, a fractal is a recursive self-similar system where one organization at one scale begins to sponsor a another iteration of that organization at another scale. And I think the Certosa of Pavia exemplifies some of those qualities. This is probably one of the most famous of the Romanesque churches, and it looks a little bit different than some. This is the Campo dei Miracoli, the Field of Miracles is what that translates to. If you look at something like this photograph, or if you look at this plan, I think this photograph is pretty great because it really does show you this notion of Romanesque massing, that the Romanesque really has to do with these platonic forms in space. And it's a collection of a number of buildings. Here we have a baptistry, and a baptistry is a new type that we should become familiar with. A baptistry will have a baptismal font in the middle, and it's pretty much circular, centralized building. Here's the church proper, and notice that there is this monk's choir attached to it. And over here we have a tower, but not a very good tower, because look what happens to this tower. It's a mess. It's leaning. But even though this surface is highly articulated with all of these little columns, it's still a severe plane. It, it still doesn't give you habitable space. It just becomes a kind of three-dimensionalized surface. So I think that's enough for now. We've got to get back and do recitations, and we will continue next time.